Uh, hey, Alexander, so uh, do you want to introduce yourself for the guests? Yeah, great. Um, so I'm Alexander Schwartz. I'm uh, working as a, pre a principal software engineer at Red Hat on the Keycloak team. Um, I've been working with Keycloak for, I think, eight or nine years now. Okay. And but not with Red Hat, right? Like, yeah, yeah, like I, I did the first pull request uh, in 2015 as a community okay, cool. member. Okay, Yeah. And uh, since uh, January 2022, I'm uh, uh, employed by Red Hat. And uh, yeah, it's cool. Uh, working fully remote from uh, in my home office near Frankfurt. Oh, nice. In Germany. Um, yeah, they, there is a Red Hat office though in Frankfurt, right? Yeah, there's one, but I... In these one and a half years, I never yeah. visited it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I can I can see how that might be. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's cool. I, I, it's funny. I talked to uh, my students about um, how you know one of the one of the interesting ways to get a job these days mm -hmm. is actually to go and contribute to like an open source project, um, and then you know eventually you might just get noticed by the organization that sponsors it, so that you can you know, potentially get a job doing whatever it is you really like. Is that mm -hmm. how you kind of get, got to Red Hat or was there other uh, considerations? Yeah, well, there's been also other considerations. So it's like I've been working as an IT consultant. I've been doing a lot of traveling before COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, then working with customers, setting up uh, job applications, doing then Keycloak for authentication and authorization. And then this project was looking for new uh, members at Red Hat uh, to join. That was cool. And so I applied. But then there's not only Red Hat contributing to that project. So right. even if you pick a project uh, like Keycloak, there are lots of companies working in this area. And there might be other companies outside Red Hat looking for it as well. So it's right. not just on a single company. That's yeah. a good thing with open source projects. Uh, you might change the employer, but not the project. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, OK, so you were working on Keycloak. It kind of pulled you in. What got you into open source in the kind of the first place? Yeah, well, I think I've been in the open source since I I was maybe 14, 15. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there were actually networks before the internet, you know? Mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, in, yeah, I remember. Um, Fido, I was a Fido point, if that's something that rings a bell with you. No, well, no. it's like your mailboxes connecting together and transfer mails like oh, two, yeah. two or three times a day. So it was in the old days. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of old. Uh, my, my college was actually on BitNet. Oh, um, so, okay. so I do have some experience with the precursors to mm -hmm. the general internet. Right. Um, but yeah. Well, well, as the internet then came up, uh, Fido was kind of dead over time. And um, yeah, I think it was online with CompuServe. Oh, right. <laughs> when okay. they distributed all these CDs. Yep, yep, I remember them. <laughs> and when, when I had done, at least before I had CompuServe, like open source was hosted on FTP servers uh -huh. uh, at that time. And you had bit FTP, so you can send an email to a service that then Yep. Grabs a file, <laughs> puts I it in the email. Well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and you would the the hardest part that I think people don't realize, right, is you would have to send an email to the FTP server uh -huh. to get a listing yeah. of what was there, <laughs> so that then you could send an email asking for whatever was there. Um, yes. Yeah, it was time. And then you don't have to mess with all your administrator if you're sending too many emails, too many volumes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was back in the time. But then still, um, once there was an internet with CompuServe and others, I had to start a website and. Mm -hmm. uh, and from static websites, I went into a PHP doing like personal projects and doing programming. Gotcha. It was really cool. And um, then I think around 2000, I then gradually went into Java yeah. when I was working in the bank. Um, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I my my first website was actually in Perl, oh, speaking of PHP. Cool. Um, but yeah, uh, it was pretty cool because it would actually it was like a search engine, but it would mm. generate more Perl code to do the searches <laughs> and then execute the Perl uh, right. kind of on the fly. Um, which was pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is exciting driving. Mm. Um, all right, so you've kind of gotten into Keycloak for a long time, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and so what you know, what do you think is coming with Keycloak, or what's what's kind of hot on the horizon in your opinion? Yeah, so with Keycloak, we've been targeting both cloud and non-cloud environment at the same time for for many many years. So mm -hmm. we're running OpenShift, you can, but you can still download the zip file and extract it and run it with OpenJDK. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really cool. And um, I think sometimes you want to develop on a local machine. You don't spin up too many containers anyway. Mm -hmm. You just want to have it up and running without it. And that's cool. Um, on the other hand, um, integrating with the cloud native space, um, there are still a lot of things to do. Um, thinking of maybe uh, cloud native events uh, that we natively integrate with that. So you can get notifications in a cloud native way of when somebody logs in and does stuff. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Right. And um, we might have more showcases where you 
secure your cluster with uh, Keycloak mm -hmm. uh, and all your, your community API server. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's I, I still feel like um, it's kind of in your kind of average website is not kind of a solved problem of the, you know, how do I get, you know, kind of authentication just kind of out of the box, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, I think Keycloak is, you know, doing a pretty good job of, uh, of trying to solve for that problem. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a daunting problem, like managing your users. It's not like authentication authorizations, but everything a user wants to do, like they want to register, they want to have some terms and conditions confirmed, they forget their passwords. Um, right. It's, it's all that stuff that you don't want to reinvent um, because it's hard to do it right. And on the other hand, um, we have communities in the Kickstarter space, like the financial grade API, um, mm -hmm where they kind of define the subset or the way you want to do op uh, OpenID Connect right, mm -hmm. um, as right <laughs> with the perspective of a bank, yeah. make it really yeah. secure. Right. Uh, and this helps a lot because people don't need to worry so much. Um, like, so that's good. On the other hand, we are handing out Keycloak as something that you can customize quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So you can write your own extensions and well, hope that it's still as secure as it was before. Right. <laughs> so you right. 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 Um, uh, that's why the approved list of extensions is often a good <laughs> idea, right? Um, yeah, and uh, I, I talked to a customer today. Um, they say the, there, are, there are lots of SPIs, as we call them, mm -hmm. service provider interfaces, and they say, well, we implemented um, extensions for 30 of your SPIs. I say, oh, wow, that you're wow. Yeah. doing quite a good job there. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, it really helps. Like you know, it's like everything else in open source world, right? It's like you know, uh, adoption really helps. You know, like you know, once you kind of have that, you know, whatever that snowball, mm. um, it really does kind of help your product as much as it helps you know the world, right? Or whatever you know thing that you think is cool. Mm. Um, so uh, I know we had a couple other things we wanted to talk about, um, but now uh, after the flustering of uh, taking that first corner, I can't remember what it was we were going to talk about next. Um, <laughs> no, we can talk about Key Club was on the horizon still. Yeah. So I'm, I'm also very much into monitoring and observability. Uh -huh. So uh, at the moment we're, I think, well, it's, it's not official package, but um, you can do, if you're interested in metrics and tracing uh, and all this stuff, you can hook up Keycloak quite easily with OpenTelemetry with the agent. Uh -huh. So you um, add it as a Java agent to Keycloak, which is also written in Java, and you get lots of nice metrics, uh, even down to the single URLs that will give you an idea like what Ereums, what are usually users actually doing with my Keycloak? Oh, okay. Are they logging in? What yeah. part of the login flow are they using? Um, yeah, are they kind of using the password reset pass uh, flow? So that that's all then recorded. Like how many times has this URL been hit, mm -hmm. and that really cool. Or what realms are most active? Right. And uh, yeah, we want to get, or I want Keycloak to get better in this area. Right. Um, so and it, and we should expose more of the um, metrics. Uh, what's well, happening. I mean, it's pretty huge for like knowing where to kind of put, you know, like your technical resources right behind uh -huh. your application. You know, if you can, if you have a good idea of what mm. people are actually, you know, doing, um, you know, it can kind of save you money and stuff without having to go and support, you know, fifty odd um, different. Uh, uh, you know, kind of authentication methods, mm. um, you know, because some of them you have to pay for and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, telemetry is really nice, um, mm. you know. Yeah, but, but I think we, we serve two kinds of users. One, one kind of user is they just want to have an uh, IAM running, identity mm -hmm. and access management running. They don't want to customize it, they just want to have it solved. <laughs> right. And right. the other ones, they want to tinker with it and uh, make this stuff that they really bring their business forward. And we, we, cater, we care for both of these right. kind of users. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm definitely in, in the bucket of, I, I wanted to just like, give me authentication, <laughs> right? And then, and then it, you know, an easy way to say, okay, this user can do this and user yeah, can do that. Yeah. Um, but once you start, you might have ideas, right? <laughs> right. Well, the other part, I mean, I think, and I think that's a big part of it too, is that you get, um, you know, as you as your kind of application grows, mm. right? You really start to find, okay, this, you know, oh, we we messed up what this role can do, right? Mm. It either has mm. too much or too little privilege, yeah. um, and you know, and so when you can kind of dynamically modify that and have a good idea of what mm -hmm. it's supposed to be doing, I think that makes a big difference too. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, what's the next? What, what would you say is the next big feature that you think is going to land with Keycloak? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we've, we've been uh, talking about uh, zero down, downtime upgrades. Oh, okay. Uh, for quite some time. I hopefully yeah. that will become a reality uh, really, really soon. Uh huh. So the idea is that um, when you upgrade from one key clock version to another key clock version, that you can do it seamlessly in a way that you run it side by side. Right. Um, right. I yeah, I was gonna say because you can't. You know, it's one of those things where you know if you're changing that user database, right? You can't. Yeah. You know, have a, a secondary server yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you can't even just run a, another one, right? Yeah. I mean, you. You know, it's kind of like a hard switch, no matter what yeah. you do. Um, but you can. People are doing lots of things already today. Sometimes doing like a read-only stuff there, or mm -hmm. switching clusters, and so. And and Red Hat is running uh, um, Clock uh, for their own customers as well. Mm -hmm. So we are um, eating oh, our uh, own dog food as a as a service. <laughs> no, but no. well, no, yeah, eventually, maybe eventually. Uh, but no, like every customer of Red Hat who is logging in. Uh -huh. It's logging over the instant of Keycloak. Oh, right, yeah. So yeah. that's we're that's eating been that way for a long time. Right? It is, yeah. it is. Yeah. And we're seeing there are lots of lots of requests and the requests are growing and Keycloak has to, um, I don't know how to say, um, keep pace with that. Right. Well, I mean, it's like it's a huge like uh, actual use case. Mm. I bet that would be really nice for that telemetry as well, because then you know, <laughs> you know, like yeah. okay, we've got you know all the developer logins on developers.redhat.com, right? Mm. Or you know, are suffering some sort of challenge, right? But all the ones into the customer portal yeah. is not, right? Mm. Um, yeah, but we are not at DevOps yet. So I'm, um, but we're working very, very closely the two, two groups working yeah. upstream and the work to the ones who are actually running. The service uh -huh. uh, for Red Hat for our customers, right? And um, and we we brought the downtime uh, quite uh, down a lot, um, uh -huh. and we are now very very satisfied with the downtime. That's nice. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, and is the rest of that infrastructure Java, or is it using? Because as I recall, like a lot of that stuff is actually Drupal, right? Uh, I well, I'm I'm not so much in, in that infrastructure. I'm all, I, I can know a bit more how the key clock setup is done. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then we're using lots of features there. We're using um, federation there, like having a user's data stored in another store. So all the features that you see in the community edition, we are very heavy users of that functionality in that lots of places. So. Right. Yeah. And um, yeah, it makes us a power user in yeah. some areas, but still, we need the community to. This thing, community still finds new ways of deploying it, and we're open for that, both in contributions and ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and while well, the community and the customers, well, of course, there's the open source community, um, and then there's the the, the customers who use uh, the product that has a subscription uh, with it. Right. Right. Um. I didn't know they could drive where the trams go. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was funny is that the trams in Boston, um, yeah. that they are all like on the roads. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them have dedicated pathway, but a lot of them are just like right in the street. <laughs> um, and so not only is it nerve wracking to drive around with um, the like the track the trams right next to you in a yeah. lane or something but the tracks themselves like you can feel them in the car and so you're kind of like oh you know yeah. am i am i in the wrong space and then you know and uh, like i can judge the distance from another car but judging it from a train is a mm. little bit you know uh a little weird so i generally avoid those roads when driving <laughs> around boston uh not that driving around boston is uh all that simple to begin with yeah but, um, but when I was in the U.S., what well, was like 10 of years, years ago, 15 years maybe, um, they had like carpool lanes. Is that still a thing? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah they, uh, there's a few of them. Usually you see them on the highways rather mm -hmm. than you, than uh, kind of like, you know, kind of regular surface roads. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, no, carpool lanes are definitely a thing and usually the best choice. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you have a carpool lane option and you have, you know, somebody else in the car, yeah. uh, they're usually the, the fastest route. So what does count as a carpool? Two people in a car? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, more than one basically. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's also, but it's time of day based too. Yeah. It's like you can use the carpool lane when um, you are, uh, you know, if it's not basically rush hour mm -hmm. uh, without other people usually, oh. but it, you know, local local rules apply. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's always local rules apply. Yeah, 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 exactly. I don't know if this is our turn. Oh, uh, the next one, I think. I want the next uh, one. You want the next one? Yeah. <laughs> He's giving us a fierce look here. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not exactly driving the best I've ever driven, I'll tell you. Um, Okay, now he's looking at us at his back mirror. Yeah, exactly. Well, it is a nice looking car, so. Um, yeah, that's it drives pretty well, though. I, like, I like how it drives. It's just, you know, I got to get used to it, which is mm -hmm. taking a little while, you know? Yeah, okay. Um, 
It's a, yeah, it's a first one I'm here for KubeCon. <laughs> so yeah, have some yeah. more drives yeah. during the week. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what What was the, uh, we were going to talk yeah. about something else too? Yeah, right? we're talking about uh, ASCII doc, our documentation, oh, ASCII doc. That's what our documentation yeah, yeah, yeah. code, yeah. Yeah, um, I've actually used ASCII doc kind of like off and on uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, it's like, we actually did a, a documentation sprint uh, for Fedora, oh. uh, uh, I guess a few years ago now. Um, it was really nice because it was in like northern, it was in Spain and then mm -hmm. it actually we moved to, um, Northern Italy, uh, which neither one okay. of them have been to So, ev if you um, ever do a documentation sprint again, yeah. just let me know and I'll yeah, be there. Yeah, you'll be there as long as it's in <laughs> Spain or Northern Italy. Um, yeah, it was really nice. Um, cool. It was actually funny. We had to change our schedule mm -hmm. when we were in Spain. Right. Um, because, you know, like typically with like conferences or stuff like that, um, you know, you feel, kind of feel guilty because you're spending a lot of money yeah. for the travel, right? Yeah. But it made a lot of sense because something like three quarters of the people involved were actually mm. European. And so it made sense to do it yeah. here somewhere. Um, and so we were planning on starting at like 8 a.m. every day and then kind of yeah. working whatever. And then we got to Spain <laughs> and we were like, this is a non-starter because we couldn't eat dinner until nine o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, and so we basically ended up shifting the schedule to start at like 10 a.m. but then work yeah. until seven, eight, you know, p.m., mm -hmm. uh, which was just, it was really funny that, you know, local culture dictated a change in our entire schedule. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was really great. Uh, I, I highly recommend, where were we? Um, um, uh, Sevilla. Oh, um, cool. And uh, yeah, it was great. But so, but I wrote doc, a big yeah. ASCII doc uh, builder engine during that sprint. Cool. Um, yeah, and ASCII doc, um, well, there's ASCII doc where you write your documentation as code and you can have your CI, CD pipeline really deliver that documentation on a steady website on maybe other things. Right. Maybe you can generate main pages from that. At, you have your choice. And, um, and Fedora is also using Entora. And Tara is then the static site generator that's built, I would say, on top of ASCII doc. Yeah, yeah. And this gives you uh, navigation on the, on the left, uh, a navigation bar on the top. Um, you can have a, a search engine uh, feed all that content to a search engine that's then on site. Right. So that makes it really, really nice. I um, think that Fedora documentation sprint yeah. is where we migrated Fedora right. to that. Oh, okay, um, cool. Yeah, and I think it was then. And yeah, Dan Allen did a great job on this one. Yeah. And um, I'm happy to say that um, I'm working for the, uh, uh, I'm maintaining the ASCII doc plugin for IntelliJ. Oh, okay. And yeah. if you were looking for, I'd say, the best support of Intora, and ask your dog in an IDE, um, then give it a try with IntelliJ and the ask your dog plugin. Mm -hmm. So um, you will have then not only syntax highlighting in the preview, but also auto completion like you would expect it from an IDE. Right. So auto completion for the for the references, for the includes, and it also uh, picked up the uh, the file structure of Antora. So it it will know that if you worked with Antora, you have these things called modules and components and a special kind of cross-references that work really, really nicely. And um, the IDE, or the ASCII doc plugin, teaches that to the IntelliJ IDE. Uh, by but does it, is it build it directly in IntelliJ? Uh, it's a plugin. You can, it's a, IntelliJ is an IDE, and you can install plugins, right. like the ASCII doc plugin, and once you install it, it has all the features. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, um, yeah the, uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's like, like, I understand the concepts behind like ASCII doc and mm -hmm. kind of other mechanisms as well, but it's a little bit hard unless you kind of have something doing real time, um, you know, for lack of a better term, compilation, um, because, you know, it's like, I want, I want to know what I'm writing kind of as it happens, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes I use the documentation, God forbid. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of a, yeah. it, it's nice to have it kind of built in like that so you can get, you know. And then the is the IDE also aware of the docs kind of as they come? Sorry. Um, well, you have a live preview in your IDE of, okay. of, of, of um, what you're writing. Of, of your writing. Yeah. yeah. You have the, like a split, uh, vertically, usually vertically split editor. Uh -huh. On the left you type, on the right you have a, a live preview. Gotcha. Like um, it, in a sub second, once you type in a sub second later, it will be refreshed. Right. Uh, in place. And you can even um, sell. Well, it comes with a standard layout um, or style sheet, uh, CSS style sheet. And if you go then one step further and tell it, well, this is the live, the, the style sheet of my live website, you will, it will make your preview look like the real site. 
Mm -hmm. So if you have like maybe special roles for different parts of the text uh, and how, how should uh, admonitions look like, mm -hmm. how does source uh, highlighting look like, it will all all be shown in the preview, like it's on the real side. Oh, cool. Yeah. So um, yeah, we went to some length and um, there was also very good uh, interaction with the community there. Um, and so with ASCII doc, do you have, because um, I don't never think I ran into this too much, but is there anything like a, kind of a LaTeX type plugin? Uh, yeah, well, there, LaTeX, I think it's, it crossed my road in, in two or three places. So you can convert it to LaTeX eventually if you want to. Uh -huh. um, you can also, if you are into math formulas, if you want to pick up only the math formula part of it, um, then you can, at least when you do HTML output, you can use LaTeX formulas and oh, okay. make, put yeah. them in the output yeah. and they will render it in a nice way. Yeah, because I, I run into uh, that a lot more now mm -hmm. that I'm teaching than yeah, I ever right. used to when I was programming. Um, you know, but uh, like one of my classes, um, I have to, you know, like teach or hopefully reteach <laughs> things like slope of a line. Oh, right. Um, yeah. You know, and how to calculate it and stuff. So that. Yeah, it's, I think it's not a. Yeah. So it's very good integrated in HTML previews. Mm -hmm. But if you want to prepare a PDF, um, the tooling is a bit, I would say, hard to handle yeah. uh, in a polite yeah. way. Um, so yeah. there, there you might be better off um, doing a lot take in, a, in, a, in the real logic way. Pull out an image and drop that in. Yeah, or yeah. I mean, that's how I do it sometimes because uh, the uh, yeah the, the basically the tech live. Uh, set of libraries is mm. complicated and somewhat difficult to install and um, yeah. you know and I have somewhat mixed success with it in my experience um, yeah but there's a project called ASCII doc web uh, ASCII doctor web PDF okay and Guillaume uh, he's doing a very good good job he's also the, um, there they are using ASCII doc you render HTML from that uh, spin it up in a chromium mm -hmm and create a multi-page PDF from that. Oh, okay. And this makes you really, really flexible. I know that you can start it any way you want as long as you can fit the rules into CSS. I'm not a CSS yeah. pro, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes I uh, kind of fail on that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, CSS has its own, you know, entertainment value. Um, yeah. Yeah I, I, yeah, I don't know. Every, everything I've, every time I've tried to, like, get good at CSS, I yeah. have failed. Um, right. You know, it's just one of those things where I just don't, you know, I just can't get it. You know, it's just hard. Yeah, I'll, well. That, I think it's an everyday thing, too, is the other problem, right? It's like, yeah. you know, programming is difficult when you don't use the tech every day. Um, um, like for my personal homepage, I pulled up Bulma CSS being a CSS framework. Okay. Um, yeah. It's a bit, well, it's not so fresh anymore, but still stable and maintained and does a good job. Mm. So it's a very, very light theme of the web page. And I managed to handle that. That was cool. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, and um, and then there's another thing on the blog called Tailwind CSS. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've used that before. And, and it's it's like cool, like, like I want to make a shadow there and let's what kind of class want to choose and how to complete that in your ID. Right. That's right. really, really exactly. cool. And that, I, that is that's my kind of CSS, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was funny. I was actually I was working on a, a site for something I don't remember what, yeah. but the um, and I was going to use Tailwind for it, um, but then I ended up uh, using MUI mm, um, right. because uh, Tail like and they weren't really like compatible or whatever. And I was like, this is yeah, one or the other me from yeah. a complexity perspective. <laughs> so, but I wanted MUI for oh, I know what it was for is because I wanted um, these really f like really complicated. Uh, rendered tables uh, um, right. yeah. and uh, and the MUI kind of built-ins and some of the add-ons were closer to what I needed mm. and Tailwind was you know meant to be a lightweight kind of efficient you know <laughs> CSS framework and didn't have these wonky tables I needed yeah 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 um, but so. then I, but yeah, if you want to have a design or at least an idea I'm not a designer anyway but when I went when I wrote like a small well I now and then give ASCII doc trainings and mm -hmm. workshops mm -hmm. And for that, I came up with a small collaborative editor. So oh. like, people come up in a group of three or five. They all open the same URL in their browser, and they start typing. And they have multiple cursors, like in Google, Google oh, Docs, cool. maybe. Oh, Google Docs, yeah, yeah. 
Yep. Um, and this is then like the real IDE or like a, the I IntelliJ IDE, but on the left you have the text, on the right you have the preview, mm -hmm. and you're all typing at the same time. Oh, that's with, cool. with a really, yeah. really low latency, like uh, sub 10 milliseconds or so. Is it? Does it do it locally, or is it going um, out across the internet and all that jazz? Uh, it will use uh, WebRTC so to try oh, okay. it locally, and if WebRTC doesn't work for whatever reason to discover the other then clients... It, it like fails to public internet? Yeah, it, it yeah. fails to WebSockets on the public internet. Yeah. And um, so it's... I think it's a, it's a hack, but yeah. in a good way. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and um, um, so I use it in trainings a lot. And I have another upcoming training next, uh, the other week, I think, yeah, the other week. And uh, that's going to be an on-site training, and I did lots of um, online trainings on this as well. Oh, so okay. that's, um, yeah, yeah it's, I'm enthusiastic about ASCII-Doc, and um, that's one of the ways I show it. Yeah, well, uh, when um, you mentioned uh, Alan, uh, what's his first name? Ted? Dan, Dan Allen. Dan. Yeah. yeah, I was like had Ted in my head for some reason, um, but uh, Still tell him. yeah, exactly. Uh, so, um, but I actually met. He was one of the first people I met uh -huh. uh, at Red Hat, mm, um, right. and uh, you know we, you know whatever, talked a lot for whatever reason. Mm. Um, I can't remember what we were working on together um, that made us cross paths, but um, yeah. So, so I knew him pretty well, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, so he introduced me to ASCII Doc. All yeah, that, right. you know. He's been a great ago. advocate on, on the community there. Yeah, um, yeah. So one of the things actually I really like about um, you know, and I know you have your favorite editor, but mine is uh, is VS Code. Right. Um, and uh, it has a really nice, uh, you know. Uh, Whatever collaborative coding mm -hmm. um, yeah. plugin, which does, I think yeah. is proprietary, but it's still yeah, really good. Yeah, it's so, really awesome. It is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, I like that a lot. Yeah. There's if you're on IntelliJ, it's code with me, uh, but it came out a lot later, after like maybe a year or maybe a year and a half mm -hmm. after Visual Studio Code was um, then. Uh, on every yeah, live every coding laptop. session, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, when it comes to live coding, at least everybody who wants to do live coding is then kind of moved right. to Visual Studio Code, and not so many people came back. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, let's see. But it's it's doing a good job on this part. Right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I just like I, I also love that it is mostly open source. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and really quite enjoy it. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, we are just about back. Yeah, um, we are. Thank you so much for the time. And, yeah. uh, you know, it wasn't that harrowing, I didn't think. Uh, so, you know, uh, in Detroit, we did a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of fast stops for things mm -hmm. like geese. Uh, um, okay. So, you know, it's uh, luckily we didn't Geese have that in so Boston, all right. Oh, no, this no, was no, in no. Detroit. Uh, in Detroit, uh, okay. Coming. Yeah, uh, so. Then I know. However, there's no parking, so. Ooh, well. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, it was cool.